<laughs> What's up, everybody? It's making it make sense. And things are heating up. Ethiopia said, I ain't testifying for nothing. Like the video as the intro plays. <laughs> so we have a lot to get into. This story moves so fast. Could somebody please make it make sense? Make it make sense to me in election. Make it make sense. <laughs> make it make sense. Make sense. Make it make sense. You know what was up. When I'm walking and he sees other dog, he right away, he jump on my vagina because he gets so crazy that he doesn't know who I am. He forgets everything. Look at me. What did I say? No. Come here. Look at me. Hey. Look at me. What did I... No. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, definitely hit that like button. If not just for her and her dog with her vagina. Uh, <laughs> okay, y'all. I want to. I really want to start with some foolishness. <sighs> y'all be really testing my patience. Somebody came and said, "You better fact check a little bit better. You need to look into who Diddy bought the house from, then who lived there. Then that's why Diddy got it. The street and the particular location with all tunnel entrance to each place. Now you will see. Yeah, Diddy had tunnels. Look, I can fact check stuff, but I never tell y'all." what to believe i know we got people from everywhere here however i do fact check and shit i spend a lot of money on fact checking and talking to attorneys and talking to private investigators and having these um i pay money every month just to get the court cases and stuff like that that stuff isn't free i do fact check that kind of stuff pisses me off really it does if you just don't agree with me, that's cool. But since you wanted to test me, we're talking about the tunnels, y'all, real quick. Now, the fact check came from here. CNN said that the initial thing about there being tunnels was not found. So then I went to a broker that I know in L.A. to see if I could get schematics. And then I went to the real estate insider and said, uh, can we get this information? Both are still working on it for me. But then I took it a step further. And I wanted to see where it initially came from. Where did the tunnels... And it was all tied into the Playboy Mansion, y'all. Since we really want to go there. And since I have so much time to investigate tunnels. Um, turns out um, around, was it 2015? I'll let you guys see. Did Hugh Hefner build secret VIP tunnels under the Playboy Mansion? It's an April Fool's joke. This is from 2015. The schematics showing tunnels under there, under the um, Playboy Mansion, this is fake. Playboy came out and said it. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know what more you want. I'm cool with you believing that there are tunnels. I could be one of these YouTube channels that just throw shit out. I, they make a lot of money just doing that. I just choose not to. But I know that there are a ton of uh, AI-generated channels. Again, this is dating back to 2015. Playboy put this out. Esquire Magazine picked it up. All the channels picked it up. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. While the internet geeks out over these pictures, it's worth noting Wednesday's date, April Fool's Day. I, I ran this because today, again, is April Fool's Day. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's where it came from. Um, the person asked me about who lived in Diddy's house before them. Nobody lived in Diddy's house before him because it was a new build. He purchased the home as a new build. But anyway... 
off that. Uh, <laughs> I don't even, uh, whatever. Um, so Khloe Kardashian booked this ad campaign. You know it's bad if your sister has a line just like this and you couldn't book skims. Her new face is looking good. <laughs> Shout out to Sipping the Monty. And can Kanye get some Cheesecake Factory in peace? What is going on in the world where you can't even get some Cheesecake Factory in peace? <laughs> anyway, all right, y'all. Let's get serious because this is some serious stuff. M remember I told you about Ethiopia? And there was... Um, in the complaint, they dropped the charges of Ethiopia, and, and the wording suggested that Ethiopia would be allegedly testifying. She gave, Ethiopia has now submitted this. Um, declar oh, and shout out to Maria, who was first on this. Um, Maria's a straight shooter, guys. Uh, declaration of Ethiopia and support a motion to dismiss. Um, it says, you know, I have personal knowledge of the facts set forth herein, which are known to me to be true and correct. I began my employment with UMG companies in 2003, blah, blah, blah. And in around February 2014, I moved over to the recorded music side of business and became the president of Motown Records. Shout out to this black lady doing it. Um, in or around March 2021, I became the chairperson and chief, chief executive officer of Motown Records. I left Motown Records and UMG November 2022. Here we go. The false allegations reg regarding my presence at Combs Homes where there were alleged drugs, underage girls, and sex workers. Um, it says, contrary to the allegations of the first amended complaint regarding my alleged presence at Mr. Combs home in Miami and New York at alleged parties at which underage girls and workers were present and being drugged, I have never visited either of those homes and I have never attended any party at any of Mr. Combs homes other than a single black tie event. Now guys, this is just coming out today. Um, in Los Angeles, sorry. Other than a single black tie event in Los Angeles on June 26, 2022, celebrating his Lifetime Achievement Award from BET. So what I don't get in this, because we have to be fair and, you know, tell all sides. But I don't get about this is you just said I have ne I've never visited either of those homes and I have never attended any party at any of Mr. Combs homes. Then in that same sentence, you say that you visited a party, a black tie event in LA at his home. So to me, that sounds like you're contradicting yourself in the same sentence. Is it so hard to believe that at a black tie event, those things could be going on? Is there so, is it so hard to believe that things could be going on in a 17,000 square foot mansion while you're in your black tie and somebody's in a back room. I feel like there's a little backtracking, but again, we got to be fair. The only property of Mr. Combs that I ever visited was in Los Angeles. And as discussed below, all of my visits preceded plaintiff's alleged commencement of his work for Mr. Combs and Love Records in September of 2022. Doesn't mean he was never at a party and saw you prior to working for him. I understand that plaintiff has now abandoned his claims that either I or Mr. Grange ever visited Mr. Combs' homes. I have been in the music industry for nearly 20 years. Now, I'm going to have to fact check that. The, I understand that plaintiff has now abandoned his claims that either I or Mr. Grange ever visited Combs' homes. I'm going to definitely fact check that. Um, I try to be a fair channel. I've been in the music industry for nearly 20 years, and in my experience, it is not uncommon for some of the most successful people in the music industry to hold business meetings at their homes. Just like we heard that Russell Simmons used to hold his business meetings at their homes. It is also very common for successful artists to have recording studios at their homes where they work on records and conduct related business. Mr. Combs' Los Angeles property included a home studio and a separate building on the property. And this is where, to my knowledge, Mr. Combs conducted most of his work and his business meetings while in Los Angeles. Um, I now have one degree of separation from Ethiopia. I just found that out. Two people I know are um, acquainted with her. <laughs> and they say she is 
actually a really, really capable woman, but um, taking, a, taking, being taken down for somebody else is not something that she would do. Uh, from what I was told, Ethiopia is, Ethiopia has Ethiopia's back. <laughs> uh, but you don't get to be president of a company without, I guess, being a very capable person. Um, I visited Mr. Combs' property a total of four times, and each time was for business purposes. Three of those times I visited Mr. Combs' property in Los Angeles were all for business meetings in connection with the license agreement between Motown Records and Love Records. So again, you said you had never really been to the houses, never been to a party. Now we know that you've been to a party and you've been to the home four times. I also visited his property for the party in Mr. Combs' backyard celebrating his Lifetime Achievement Award from BET. My first visit was in spring of 2022, preceding the license agreement. The purpose of the meeting was to listen in Mr. Combs' home studio to the recordings he had already made for his album that Love Records intended to release. There was no party involved. My second visit to Mr. Combs' home was within a few weeks after the license agreement was signed. This meeting wasn't... Now, I don't believe that Little Rod said that it was all for parties. They said that they've been to the home multiple times. And I think he said, now these are his allegations, that Lucian would go into the room with Diddy for hours. Um, she says, it was purely business. I was there with my team and we met with Mr. Combs and his team. Again, by his own admission, plaintiff could not have been there and there were no underage girls or workers. On my third visit, as I mentioned above, was a formal black tie event held outdoors in Mr. Combs' property, celebrating the Lifetime Achievement Award from BET that he had received at the BET Award Show earlier that day. There were many people in attendance at his, this event, including high-profile artists and producers. However, plaintiff would not have been there as it was in late 2022 and can state without any hesitation, I observed no underage girls, no workers, or drug use at the party. My final visit to Mr. Combs' home in Los Angeles occurred in July of August 2022. The purpose of the visit was to discuss the delivery and release schedule for Love Records, Inc. And to have a face-to-face -face conversation with Mr. Combs to make sure we met our release deadlines. Again, the meeting preceded plaintiff's own claim start of his work for Mr. Combs and Love Records, and I observed no underage girls. I have no recollection of ever having met Rodney Jones, the plaintiff in this action. As far as I know, he was never present at any of the four times I visited Mr. Combs' property. Indeed, according to the plaintiff's own timeline and his amended complaint, it would have been physically impossible for me to have ever met him at Mr. Combs' home in Los Angeles because my visits there all preceded commencement of his alleged work. Um, the rest of it is more about licenses, agree licensing agreements. Um, the purpose of her explaining this is to say that she was not aware that any of the funding that came from her company was used in any of these RICO claims. Is a, I can just imagine Tyrone is probably working on his letter right now because her attorney and Lucian's attorney uh, came back at Tyrone. Y'all, <laughs> I'm telling you, literally, you cannot make this up. They are going back and forth almost like daily. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I do have to say, Kudos to the black woman who does it. I mean, not this part, but, you know, makes it to the level of president of a company. <clears throat> um, in public statements announcing the license agreement, I'm aware that both Motown Records and Love Records expressed their excitement at partnering with respect to Mr. Combs' forthcoming album. This was a colloquial use of the term partner or partnering, meaning in Tyrone's complaint, he took their press releases and said, you guys are connected. They are now saying, don't pay attention to the press releases. Pay attention to what's in the actual agreements. So the, the waters are muddied here, y'all. I, I mean, I got to call it like I see it. It's pretty muddy. Why would there be press releases and things of that nature if you did not actually have a... Okay. It's muddy. Um, moreover, as I said, the only listening session I ever attended Mr. Combs in Los Angeles properly, the only one I ever visited was before the license agreement was entered into in order to listen to the recordings he had already made in his home studio. I do not know if there was any security at Mr. Combs home, but if there were, my understanding is that he 
or one of his companies would have been responsible for it, not Motown Records. With respect to the writer's camp at Chalice Studios in September 21, I did briefly visit the studio to hear some of the new tracks that had been recorded or were in the process of being recorded. I have no recollection of meeting the plaintiff at Chalice Red Studios. There were a number of different rooms there, and it may be that the plaintiff was in a different area that I was in if he was there at all. So right here, again, very muddy. You don't technically know, and you don't remember him if you did. So now we got, I, you know, I've never seen him. I don't know him. To now it's moved to if, if he was in a different area, if he was there at all. Um, I kind of get it, though. Her, Lucian, they were all thrown into this lawsuit, and now everybody is scrambling. Attorneys are being called. Attorneys are getting angry. I low-key kind of get it. Like, <laughs> nobody wants... Everybody wants an invite to the party until it turns out that there's underage people, uh, illicit drugs, and sex workers. Then all of a sudden, though, nobody want to be um, at the party. Kind of like Carisha. She was just a whore with a W a couple days ago until somebody actually calls you a whore with a W. And then all of a sudden, it's, that ain't me. I'm not about that life. <laughs> Are y'all picking up on this? Everybody wants an invite to the party until the party gets busted. And then all of a sudden, you wish you was actually at home. <laughs> That's the way it works. Um, let me see if I have that other one. I never gave any cash to Mr. Combs or Love Records, and I'm not aware any cash ever provided. I hear you, Ethiopia. Um, let's see. Okay. Here we go. So this is her attorney. Now the attorney's gotten in it and the attorney's mad. Again, this is breaking news. This is fresh. <laughs> this is nothing that anybody else, I don't believe, has talked about as of yet. Um, let's see. As plaintiff and Mr. Blackburn no doubt intended, the baseless claims made against the UMG defendants in the FAC have attracted press attention, causing immediate reputational harm. In an effort to mitigate that harm, the UMG defendants voluntarily waived service so they could file a motion to dismiss as soon as possible. Now plaintiff and Mr. Blackburn want to further delay dismissal of the claims by seeking the court's permission to amend the FAC. For all the reasons set forth below and UMG defendants pending motion to dismiss the FAC, the motion to amend should be denied as futile. Um, let's see. Why then does the proposed essay abandon every single maliciously false foundational allegation of the FAC? No explanation is offered for where the completely baseless parent company allegation the FAC came from. Why was it abandoned or what were the facts to support the general partnership allegation? No explanation for the disappearance of the vast sums of cash allegations is offered. The only change Mr. Blackburn tries to explain is the jettisoning of the accusations that Sir Lucian Grain attended and sponsored parties. Um, and it says, Mr. Blackburn relies solely on legally meaningless press reports and website shorthand descriptions. So are you acknowledging that you put out these press reports? Explained and rejected in the declaration of Ms. Habertons in support of the UMG defense motion to dismiss. Exhibit one here too, which also notes her rejection of his attempt to foist a false declaration on her. Attached as exhibit two is a letter from Ashley Lynn to Mr. Blackburn stating that he had been specifically advised that his partnership allegation was false. Attached as exhibit three is the declaration of Ms. Bra sorry, Braithwaite in support of UMG's defendant's motion to dismiss. Uh, basically, this attorney is saying, Tyrone Blackburn, I think you're full of shit. Now, again, it's muddy because if Tyrone is using press releases that you put out to indicate that there was a partnership, then the question is, where did those press releases come from? Um, Sheila Hamilton, did they reopen Kim Porter case? I'm a newbie. Welcome to the channel. No, they haven't. Um, the case that they are looking into is J-Lo, Shine, and Diddy. J-Lo, you in danger, girl. Um, thank you for the super chat and welcome to the channel. Uh, Black Swan, thank you for gifting 20 memberships. All right, I appreciate that. 
Um, on the next members only live, something strange happened to me involving this Diddy stuff, and I'll kind of talk about it on there. It was super weird. Um, and luckily, um, the young lady who won the Tumblr was there to witness it. So she'll come on and we'll talk about it. But it was some weird, some weird shit. <clears throat> okay. Y'all, I'm sure Tyrone is going to come out swinging. Maybe tomorrow. I'll let you guys know. But I really want to get into the J-Lo stuff. J-Lo thought she was... J-Lo's another one. She was fine with being Jenny from the block until they allegedly put a gun in your hand and have you involved in a police chase. She was fine with being Jenny from the block back then. <laughs> uh, wearing the bandanas, matching stuff, um, rolling around with Diddy, living the best life, having him produce that first album. She was Jenny from the block. Up until the block got hot. Once the block got hot, she said, no, no. Mm -mm. <laughs> Moved right on to Ben Affleck and started making movies where she was the only Latin person in the movie. <laughs> Let me stop on. Let me get off J-Lo. Uh, but OK, yeah. So let's get into this. Fed set to widen Diddy sex probe over claims rapper boasted about pow powing people, bribing jurors, and using J-Lo as a gun mule. Almost 25 years ago, just after 2.30 a.m. on a cold winter night, three NYPD detectives were called to the Midtown North Precinct. Rap impresario Sean, John, Sean Combs, then known as Puffy, his girlfriend Jennifer Lopez, his bodyguard Anthony Wolf Jones, who was no longer, who was no longer with us only, what, like a year after this? Maybe two years? After this, another person no longer with us. And rapper Jamal Shine Barrow had been arrested following a pow pow inside of a Times Square club that wounded three bystanders. The cops found Lopez, then 30, cuffed in the cage. Combs was also in the station house on West 54th Street. His plans for a spectacular celebration for the new millennium a few days later, temporary on hold. Remember, she was, she was, don't be fooled by the rock she got. She was just Jenny from the block. Now the events of that night and the sensational trial that followed in early 2001 are back in the spotlight. Two law enforcement sources tell the Post that the infamous pow powing and the trial could possibly be reinvestigated as part of the sweeping federal probe into Combs, now 54, called Diddy, whose past includes more than one mysterious pow well, shooting. We'll just say that. On Monday, Homeland Security agents, we know about that. We know about that. The uh, Blah, 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 blah. Excuse me. Jones alleged in his suit that Diddy was violent, threatened to eat his face, brandished guns, and most pointedly, was often bragging about bribing witnesses and jurors in the criminal case concerning the 1999 NYC club shooting with Shine. The shooting stemmed from an argument between Diddy and a Brooklyn thug named Matthew Allen, whose real name, whose nickname was Scar. But Diddy, his bodyguard Anthony Jones, and Sean Barrow endured a seven-week trial in February, February and March of 2001, which ended with Diddy and Jones walking free and Barrow, then 21, being convicted on assault and gun possession and sentenced to 10 years. Mysteriously, still, mystery still surrounds the club New York shooting, especially for the former NYPD detective Derek Parker, who left the so-called hip-hop cop squad at the NYPD is now a private investigator. Um, Diddy has been dogged for years by the rumors that he made Shine, now now known as Moses Michael Levi. It's real interesting. You got Shine, who's now Jewish. Mace became a pastor, and Loon went to the um went to the nation of Islam. Everybody who gets away from Diddy has to go find God. Mace said, I don't even want the money no more. I'm getting away. Um, the story was that Puff was flossing. Okay, we don't need to get into that. Y'all. So then I started researching because this was a little bit, I really wasn't into, you know, all this stuff in 2001. Um, <laughs> but I, I started researching and I found this channel and some stuff from Loon that I want you guys to see. Um, shout out to this channel. What I did was in the description, I put this whole video. So you will want to check that out. Um, this guy is really dope. 
who was the instigator. I know Scar from Brooklyn. Those, those, those are my guys. I didn't really have a problem with them. That wasn't my beef. That was that was Puff's issue. They had a problem with Puff for whatever reason. I don't know what their problem was with Puff. Scar, Nino, and the entire Brooklyn crowd was in Club New York. I seen them. It was all love. But when they started arguing with Puff, I know what these Brooklyn guys are capable of. I know what Scar is capable of. I knew what Nino was capable of. I know what happens once these arguments start. You know, when these arguments start, you know, it, it, it becomes it becomes a problem. Once Scar, once Scar starts saying, you know, I'm gonna kill you, you know, you DOA, you know, once he starts talking crazy, yeah, I, I became afraid for my life. I know what happens, you know, once he says, you know, it's, it's about to happen, you know, it, it's about to happen. While all of this was going on, one of Alan's friends allegedly threw a stack of money into Puff's face and the situation instantly turned dark. According to Shine, he saw somebody reach for a gun and he immediately reached for his to defend himself and his friends. It didn't take long before the shots were fired. I think somebody reached so this is the full breakdown of what happened to give you guys some context because i i'm pretty sure um everybody does not remember not where is booty butter y'all are crazy four gun and i reached for my weapon and i defended my friends and myself because once he starts firing once whoever else pulls out a gun starts firing it doesn't stop it both parties started shooting at each other. In the crossfire, Shine managed to hit one of Alan's friends in the shoulder. After he hit him, the security guard tried grabbing Shine from the back, and that's when his gun allegedly went off into the air, leaving a bullet hole in the club's ceiling. According to the reports, Diddy was also firing shots in the club, but more on that later. Unfortunately, during the chaos, two innocent bystanders were hit, which also includes a woman who was hit in the face, but ultimately managed to survive. Shine with a gun in his hand, tried running out of the club, but ultimately was captured by the police officers waiting outside. Diddy and Lopez jumped to their Lincoln Navigator in an attempt to flee the scene. Puff, his bodyguard Anthony Wolf jumped Jones, better known as Jeannie Deal, Jennifer Lopez, and his driver, Wardell Fenderson, were chased by the police officers for more than 20 blocks, but ultimately were stopped and arrested. During the pursuit, allegedly one gun was tossed out the window, and another- Are y'all hearing this? And you people be questioning why they think Diddy is dangerous. For those of you who have never actually fully heard the story, he literally fled the scene, J-Lo, Wolf, and the driver. For 20 blocks, they went on a high-speed chase with J-Lo, who's Jenny from the block at this point, and they throw a pow pow out of the window as if people aren't going to know, or, you know, they're chasing you. Of course, they're going to see something being thrown out the window. You have the lights on you. Another one was later found under the driver's seat. The prosecution later alleged that Puff Daddy himself was trying to bribe his driver to take the charge for the gun during the police chase and even offer him $50,000. Eventually, all of them were detained and taken into custody. Involved are you guys hearing this? So they're reopening the case. Um, the allegation is that J-Lo was actually the one who brought the pow pow into the club. I, you know, I started researching the case. Part of the charges brought against Puffy were the fact that his celebrity status and, and some of the civil lawsuits involved in this were the reason that J-Lo, nobody got patted down from his clique. So they were all allowed to just bring pow pows in there because of who he was. That was the allegation or not, Puff Daddy is facing charges after he and Lopez were caught fleeing the nightclub shooting with a stolen gun in the car. Charges have been dropped against Lopez, but Combs, his bodyguard, and the driver are all charged. It hasn't been determined who had possession of the gun, but his lawyer says the car is registered to Puff Daddy's record company. 21-year-old Jamal Barrow, a lesser-known rapper and part of Combs' entourage at the dance club, was indicted by a grand jury on a slew of charges. One person was indicted for uh, attempted murder who was in the club. Um, and was involved in the shooting. This was not a good press for anybody, and it got a lot of unfavorable attention from the media. The case immediately drew headlines, not because of the three people wounded on the shooting, but because of the celebrity of those arrested. While awaiting their trial, which only started in January 2001, on September 26, 2000, Bad Boy Records released Shen's debut album. Again, she don't want to be Jenny from the block when the block is hot. The block is hot, she gets out of there. And, and have we ever seen her date a black man after that? I don't think so. Mm -mm. <laughs> Never saw her with a black man again. Only the one who was producing her album that produced such great hits that she didn't even sing on. Why am I being messy? It says, <laughs> um, instead of JLo recording the song, she let the demo vocals on the song and failed to credit Milan or Ashanti. That was for the other song. For the this song, it says, former Star Trek singer 
Natasha Ramos sings the track's chorus, bridge, and ad-libs. Ramos also contributed vocals to multiple songs on Lopez's third album, This Is Me. <laughs> Ramos has downplayed her contribution. How can you downplay the contribution? On the actual song, she left the girl's vocals, who, which included the chorus, the bridge, and all the ad-libs. Jenny from the block wasn't even Jenny from the block. It was really Natasha. <laughs> Let me stop being messy for the J-Lo fans. Get me. <laughs> All Shine. Although Shine himself got a lot of backlash because of the shooting, the album was a great success. It peaked at number five on the Billboard 200. So it's a shoot. I'm trying to make it clear to you. I want to say to, to you all face to face, I had nothing to do with a shooting that night in a nightclub. The trial started on January 17, 2001. The case would be later known as the Puff Daddy trial due to Combs' celebrity status. Puff Daddy and his bodyguard were charged with gun possession, assault, and bribery. Shine, on the other hand, faced attempted murder, assault, gun possession, and reckless endangerment charges. Puff hired himself two high-profile defense lawyers, Johnny Cochran and Benjamin Braffman. Cochran's clients have included O.G. Simpson and Michael J. You hire... Johnny Cochran to help get you off and an attorney who catered to mobsters. Jackson, while Braffman has represented such clients as Salvatore, Sammy the Bulgravano, Shannon unfortunately was left alone and he had- Are y'all seeing a pattern? Are y'all wondering why people are scared? Are you wondering why people are scared? <laughs> Had to hire his own attorney. Puff cut all ties with him, and his laws would later go as far as asking judge to trial them completely separately, which ultimately was denied. Two of three victims, the guy who was hit in the shoulder, and the are you guys hearing this? This man allegedly was helping you because he was fine with these people. Again, you should check out the full video from um this guy's channel. He goes into depth how Shine was in gangs as a kid. Um was not new to these people who were currently in the gang. They were actually from his hood. So Sean would have been fine going in and out. The issue was Puffy. Now that this shooting has occurred, the only people you are trying to protect are Wolf, JLo, yourself. But Sean was left out to dry. The girl who was shot in the face both made civil suits against Puff Daddy. This will become an important detail later. At trial, the prosecution proposed that Puff was a I noticed that Puffy can't close his mouth a lot of the times. I don't really know what that's about. But in a lot of pictures, his mouth is open. I don't know if anybody else noticed that. He can't really close his mouth. I don't know. I Maybe he... What, were veneers a thing back then? Just wondering. Mouth is always open. It was closed here, but he was sucking in his lips. <laughs> All the earlier photos... <laughs> responsible for the shooting because this celebrity status had allowed this party to enter the club new york without being searched for weapons they also accused combs of firing a gun into the club ceiling during the fight and the hole in it wasn't from shine's gun but rather from his the girl who was shot in the head natania rubin testified that she saw both combs and barrel both fire the gun you heard that the actual bullet was from puffy's gun explain to me how this man is getting off i'm not famous I don't have a publicity machine. I don't have a billion dollars of insurance on my body, or any part of my body for that matter. Does that make me any less valuable? Remember the civil lawsuits made against Puff Daddy I told you about? Well, Puff's lawyer Barfman responded to her testimony with an accusation that she was trying to malign Combs' reputation to her multi-million dollar damages lawsuit against him. The second witness was a chauffeur, Wardell Fenderson, the guy who was driving the Black Lincoln Navigator during the pursuit. He testified that he saw Combs slip a pistol into his waistband before entering Club New York. The driver also claimed that Combs and his bodyguard Jones fumbled with a hidden compartment in the vehicle, trying to hide the weapon as police chased him from the club, claiming that he saw either Jones or Combs throwing the weapon from the SUV. Fenderson also accused Combs of offering a diamond ring as a part of $50,000 payment for claiming ownership of the gun found in the vehicle. He recalled Puff saying, listen, you know I'm Puff Daddy, I can't take the gun. When it came to the prosecution witnesses, the trial started to become weirder and weirder by the minute. Are y'all hearing this? You can't like write this. You cannot like write this. I'm Puff Daddy. I can't take the charge. So there is a gun charge. You are forcing the driver 
who's now going to be arrested to drive. You have weapons in the car. I don't even understand how the driver got in trouble for this. Technically, I feel like the police did him a disservice because if there are weapons and dangerous people and you are just the driver, why would you have to go down with them? It doesn't even make sense. The prosecution called up three witnesses, two of them, both of whom had testified before a grand jury, that they witnessed an argument between Combs and Allen, aka Scar, changed their stories on the stand. They denied being able to identify Combs as a participant in the scuffle or seeing him with a gun. A third witness admitted that she was unsure. Are y'all hearing this? They changed their testimony on the stand prosecution witnesses. The trial started to become weirder and weirder by the minute. The prosecution called up three witnesses, two of them, both of whom had testified before a grand jury, that they witnessed an argument between Combs and Allen, aka Scar, changed their stories on the stand. They denied being able to identify Combs as a participant in the scuffle or seeing him with a gun. A third witness admitted that she was unsure what she might have seen in Combs' hand as he ran from the club. It was more than strange for witnesses to switch up their stories that fast. And while this was great news for Puff, it put Shan into an even stickier situation because the witnesses that testified not seeing a gun in Puff's hand implicated that it wasn't Shan. When it came to witnesses changing their story on the stand and now implicating shine only. Now you can't say that you saw Puffy, but you can say for damn sure that you saw shine. Somebody said no Diddy. No Diddy's going too far because now you got Jocelyn saying it. Jocelyn, who has renamed herself Cocaline, talking about no Diddy. How about no Coke, Jocelyn? How about no Coke? How about what are you holding in this picture? Get off my screen. <laughs> to Puff's defense, they begun their case by stating that Puff died not only never fired a gun, but he didn't have one in the first place. Thank you for coming. On Sunday evening, I went to Club New York, and under no circumstances whatsoever did I have anything to do with a shooting. I do not own a gun, nor did I possess a gun that night. I had nothing to do with a shooting in this club. I want to make this 100% clear. I had nothing to do with a shooting in this club, and I feel terrible that people were hurt that night. They denied all the claims against them, even the money being thrown at his face, and were accusing people of looking to make a quick buck from a famous executive. Sound familiar? Said the same thing about Cassie, said the same thing about Little Rod, said the same thing about Jane Doe, and said the same thing about the other alleged victim. The lady who was pow pow in the face has consistently said that she saw Puff Daddy doing it. Their stance is... She's just looking for money in the civil suit. Can you believe it? No one threw money at him. It's a lie. When, when is it going to be fair for Sean Puffy Combs? When? He's out with Jennifer Lopez. If you are out with your... When is it going to be fair for Puffy Combs? Because, you know, everybody... I'm going to show you how we have fun to stay out of jail, too. And make money. When is it going to be fair for Puffy, y'all? Friend, and you got into a car and there was a gun in the front, you wouldn't be arrested. Several witnesses recalled Combs dancing on a coffee table at the club with his arms raised, but none of them saw a gun in his waistband. The most damaging witness to the prosecution was security guard, Cherby Myers. She recalls Car Allen throwing money in Puff's face and being jostled as club's customers grapple for cash. Myers was advising Combs to leave the club rather than argue with Allen when she saw Barrow firing twice, even going as far as saying that he was the one who let off shots first that night, which went completely against Shine's defense. Afterwards, she proceeded to fall on top of Combs to protect him. An important detail to mention is that this witness was called by Puff's attorney and not the prosecution. Calling this witness tremendously helped Diddy, but it completely threw Shine under the bus. When Combs took the stand in his own defense, his attorney asked him if he had a gun at any time on the night of the incident, to which he replied, absolutely not. During the rest of the trial, the prosecution kept reminding the jury that they were shooting victims in the case and that Combs had actively tried to bribe witnesses to change their testimony, to which Combs' attorney responded with, bad people came into this courtroom and made bad accusations because they wanted to get rich. Shine, on the other hand, didn't have such high-level lawyers. Shine was accused of firing three shots that wounded three people. He admitted to shooting a gun and hitting a guy in the shoulder, but claimed that he only acted in self-defense. Shine stated that he had also fired into the air, but did not believe that it was bullets from his gun that injured the other two bystanders. This is where it once again gets interesting, because an 
eyewitness and a ballistics expert also testified during the trial and claimed that the three injuries may have been caused not by Shine, but by a second gunman. The ballistics expert said that at least one injury may have been caused by 40 caliber weapon, and if according to witness, Puff was indeed standing where they claimed he was, the hole in the club's ceiling would have come from him and not from Shine. The interesting part is that when Shine ran outside of the club, he held a 9mm pistol, but 40 caliber shells were also later found on the floor. The other two guns which were taken by the police were also 9mm. Despite several witnesses who claimed that they seen Puff shooting and having the gun at the scene, including his driver and the girl who got shot in the face, unfortunately for Shine, the overwhelming majority of witnesses put a gun in his hand, and him admitting to firing at least once, even though claiming in self-defense, was more than enough for the jury. Do y'all see how that works? Now Puffy has wiped his hands clean. All the stuff of throwing a gun out, like, <laughs> this is some scary shit. Um, let's see. Jamie, thank you so much. Jamie's been here, like, since day one. He says, great work as always, sir. Thank you. KB, thank you for the super sticker. Thank you for becoming a member, April. Um, J-Lo after the club. The ghetto. The ghetto. <laughs> <laughs> right that's exactly what she was saying Ooh, child the ghetto you're right <laughs> um tony wiggins um goodbye brother fake love he's done i don't know tony he got out of that one um dawn thank you so much for joining the membership azure thank you for joining the membership um sunkiss says mims j-lo wanted our butt style and flex our black girl flavor but didn't want our problems jenny colonized and fled the block <laughs> Um, and J Blue says P Diddy is guilty. Take that, take that. LOL. Thank y'all. Thank you for the super chats. March 16, 2001, the case was finally closed, and the verdicts were these. Combs and his bodyguard Jones were acquitted of all charges, which all included time. illegal ownership of three 9mm guns and bribery. Chan was convicted at trial by a jury on two counts of assault. Acquitted of all charges, even the gun charges, when they found two guns, one thrown out the window and one in a secret compartment inside the SUV acquitted and reckless endangerment and criminal possession of an illegal weapon. The only bright side was that he was acquitted of attempted murder. His sentencing was set to June 1st, 2001. To say that the news was devastating for Shine, I think would be an understatement. Right after being found guilty, he was also hit with a $5 million lawsuit by Mark McKenzie, a guy who was injured during a car incident. The court would later shut down the lawsuit after evidence appeared that McKenzie was the one who ran the red light and was responsible for the incident. Shine was cautioned for driving without license, but not with I think the biggest problem is for the people who trust him completely like Shine did. Impact on his life, Sean Puffy Combs. As you know, from the media standpoint, your trial was the Puffy trial. Do you feel that worked against you all? The fact that 99% of the focus was on him? Obviously, he was the uber star and I was just up and coming. So, you know, yeah, it's going to be a show. But he used that to just, you know, just threw me off. Like, you know, it was, it was just terrible, man. To many, Jamal Shinebarrow is an answer to a trivia question. As the man who once stood trial. So he's letting the people know that this man <laughs> completely threw him under the bus. But what you might be interested to know is even after all that, two years ago, Diddy interviewed Shine for Revolt TV and endorsed his political candidacy in his native country of Belize, where it's alleged that Diddy played a role in him getting deported back to. Now, I tried to look up if you could determine who were people's um, donors in Belize, and I couldn't find where that information is readily available to the public. But I would be really interested to know how you just acknowledge that somebody threw you under the bus, tried to separate the tried to separate um, your case from their case, and then didn't even help you get an attorney. Now, twenty years later, you're being interviewed by him as he endorses you for a political candidate candidacy. Now, Shine has one, um, he has, he is in the political party. Um, his father used to be prime minister of Belize, so he does have some connections that way. But it's very interesting how you just forgive and forget. P. 
people have alleged that uh, was a Gene Deal or was it Craig Mack? Not Craig Mack. Um, Mark Curry alleged that Diddy paid him a million dollars to take the rap. But it gets extremely muddy when you think that this person turned on you while you were trying to protect them and you come back and they endorse you for political candidacy. Somebody said Puffy had a bag waiting for Sean. A bag of what? Allegedly. <laughs> a bag a bag of what did he have? Um, let's see. Dr. Cook, thank you so much for oh, thank you for the super sticker. Um, Bryn Cap says, after Diddy, J Lo went to Mark Anthony, Ben Affleck, and anyone else who was non-African American male. <laughs> she said F them ninja. <laughs> um, Leisha, thank you for becoming a member. Tommy Bites TV said, Diddy has been guilty, probably my got Mary J on. Diddy has been guilty, probably got my, oh, 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 I just got what you're saying. Oh, no. <laughs> um, Kudos to Mary for, you know, putting all those demons behind her. I just got what you were saying. Uh, hey, Ms. Parker says, when you're an informant, you can, you can scave your way out. Uh, I got what you were saying, Tommy Vice TV. Uh, she wants to reiterate, he probably got Mary J on the snow. Thank God Mary has, you know, you know, turned her life around and, you know, survived and thrived in spite of her affiliations with Diddy. Uh, we got like 7,300 in the chat. Definitely hit that like button if you're new to the channel. Um, we're actually super close to hitting now 155,000 subscribers. So if you're new, definitely hit that like button. If you are not new to the channel, um, y'all know already that hitting the like is a free way to support the channel. His co-defendant and the infamous trial that landed him here behind bars. People probably have the impression that you're just consumed with the idea that, you know, justice wasn't served here and that somebody turned his back on you. It's not a matter of, you know, turning your back on me. Like, how do you call a witness to testify against your comrade? That witness oh, Shine is referring to is Sharice. Um... Um, Empress Q says, Mims, the Lady Puffy shot is in the chats. Um, what's the name? I didn't see. And, um, if you are in the chats, then so sorry you had to go through that at the hands of Diddy, allegedly. And, you know, kudos to you for being brave enough to actually continuously speak truth to power um let's see the dopest nerd is that your name oh okay this is you thank you empress q if you want to come up i'll drop the link for you if you're more than welcome to but only for the dopest nerd I, i'm not going to let anybody else up but if you want to come up and share your story or just kind of talk you're more than welcome to do so but only for the dopest nerd um oh it says an error occurred that has never happened before okay i dropped the link for you so you're more than welcome to come up if you want uh the people are saying please talk <laughs> you don't have to if you don't <laughs> you don't have to if you don't want to okay <clears throat> so let's get back to this Myers, a bouncer who was working inside Club New York when shots rang out that December night in 1999. In court, Myers claimed that she fell on top of Puffy during... So that's what we were talking about a minute ago. She actually was, it seems like the one person who did not, um, seemed like the one person who did not actually, you know, take the bribe, allegedly. Um, did he take the heat off Liz... <laughs> Diddy taking the heat off Lizzo's bananas. 
<laughs> Thank you, Johnny Smiles. Um, Brim Cap said, P. Diddy or a troll is in the chat. What's the troll saying, y'all? I don't, you know, I can't keep up. Oh, okay. The nerd is getting a lot of support. I don't know. Okay, so I see the dopest nerd in the background. I don't see the troll guys. Um, but if you see it and you're the mod, definitely take it out. <laughs> hey, welcome to the channel. Hi, how you doing? I'm okay. I'm I'm glad to see you're alive and well. I'm glad to be alive and well. Surviving, okay. thriving, and um, continuously speaking truth to power, which I don't think enough people do. And first and foremost, let me say thank you for that. And I appreciate all you guys that are paying attention to the case and highlighting all of the lies that have been allowed to permeate the atmosphere for all these years. Thank you so much. It means the world to me. It means the world to my children. I mean, my children won't uh, speak out. You know, they've been in the media and in the, you know, out in the open and they're scarred by that. But um I can only imagine. Well, I can't imagine because yeah. you spoke about some pretty powerful people. Mm -hmm. And it's been quite a ride. And it's, you know, I would have to say that the I'm while I'm very grateful for all of the people who are complimentary and who are being supportive now, it has not been that for 24 years. It has been quite wicked and evil out there. I mean, I've had people recognize me in the street early on in the beginning and follow me and curse me out and tell me I was trying to take down hip hop and take down a good black man. And I was like, what are they talking about? Like, I'm a victim. I'm a survivor, but I was victimized. I didn't set up, I didn't sign up for that. I literally got up and went out to support my friend. In fact, I had just gotten saved. I wasn't even in the clubs, but one of my girlfriends was a huge party promoter and I went out to support her that night because her party was coming up on New Year's Eve. That was it. That was it. In fact, everybody that saw me in front of the club, all of the people that knew me, I was an entrepreneur. You know, a lot of the, a lot, for some reason that's not highlighted. I owned multiple beauty salons and barbershops in New York as I've done since I've had to move away from New York. I've been an entrepreneur all my life. I fed the homeless out of my shops for years. In fact, my, my clients and my friends would help me. Everybody knew me for a humanitarian. I didn't understand how the whole world turned on me because I got shot in the face. It made no sense. Because we are a celebrity driven culture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your life, your children's lives, it's insignificant in the grand scheme of things because like Charlemagne said, you know, I'm hurt that this person who influenced culture is now, you know, potentially going down. That's what I just heard him say today. And I was like cringing at the thought. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so much of it is cringy. Um, you know, I did a second interview on News Nation and I felt like it was completely different than the first one. You know, one is in the coral shirt. That was the first one. The one in the blue shirt was very adversarial. He cut me off a million times. It's as if he didn't want me to get my story out because I was too knowledgeable. I had too many facts. I laid out, you know, the standard for the RICO and, att and attached him to every single count that would allow a RICO charge to stand against him. He, he didn't seem too happy about that. And, you know, he's like, I see you did your research. You know, they have a truncated version of that interview on YouTube and on their page. But if you go to my, uh, my TikTok, mm -hmm. I have the whole version of the video there. And oddly enough, I'm banned everywhere now. My, my TikTok is suspended. Every time, uh, Every time different bloggers or podcasters try to reach out to me, as soon as they reach out to me, I'm suspended. In fact, I didn't even know I was suspended. They had to tell me, I tried to reach out to you again. I'm su you're suspended. I was like, what do you mean suspended? For what? I don't, I'm 53. I don't do suspendable things online. So your TikTok is not up now. My TikTok is up, but what they've done is they've uh, suspended me. So I can't communicate with anybody like DMs and stuff like that. And a lot of my comments are not showing up. Wow. And my and now my Instagram is also. I mean, like I told people for years since 2015, I started noticing that I was getting hacked. And I kept saying somebody cyber stalking me. Somebody cyber stalking me. You know, some people would listen, the closest people that really knew me. Some people would be like, "Girl, he ain't thinking about you." And I'm like, "I'm telling you, 
I could take my family out to dinner, all my cards won't work. I could take the money out of my checking, send it to my son, and he can pay for it with that money, but I can't pay for it. Wow. It's nonsense. How So how has this impacted you? Or I should say, has have the new allegations like triggered you at all? Does it bring up old emotions? Those old emotions have never left, sad to say. Um, you know, I suffered from PTSD for a long time. I probably will for the rest of my life. I can say that it's been heightened. There's a hyper awareness there. It's not a comfortable way to exist because- I, I'm only laughing. I, 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 I struggle with the same thing. Um, my therapist called it hypervigilance. Mm -hmm. It's hyper -vigilance. You're always on, you know, yep. because of the things that have yep. impacted you in life. I, I, I see you. We see each other. And it's and I'm hyper reclusive also. And I was a social butterfly. Like I said I own beauty salons, barber shops, spa, very well known in New York. You know, I do parties. I was always in Cancun, just the whole thing. Everybody knew me and I turned into a recluse. I was a social butterfly. And when I tell you, I have been a recluse for the better part of 24 years. It's not a nice feeling. I mean, I'm contented, but you know, I'd like to be able to just go out in a carefree moment of, hey, let's go grab some ice cream. My head is on swivel the whole time. Now it's even worse. Do you currently feel safe? No. You don't? No. That's a, that's a horrible feeling. It's, it's a horrible feeling. I don't feel safe. When you were in the thick of this case, this lawsuit, did you currently have kids? I had two sons, yes. So you weren't just fighting for yourself, you were fighting for your family, you were fighting for your life, you were fighting, did did the case affect your beauty shops and barber shops? Absolutely it did. Um, you know, I said this somewhere else, but you know, I will say it again. The district attorney's office uh, received information from a confidential informant that there was $150,000 put on my head. I had to be moved out of New York in the middle of the night because of that. So this is all, all this case needs to be reopened. There was a, there's a young lady on uh, YouTube, Leah Gordon. My daughter and I were just enjoying a day a few days ago, sitting in the bed, watching TV together. She kind of does this. She's very clingy with me now. Um, and she said, we were watching TV and it just came across the street. It said, Natanya Rubin's story. And I was like, what? This young woman did the beautiful piece. I cried. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm a Brooklyn Trinidadian girl. I cried like a baby and I'm not like that. This woman handled me with such care and it's making me emotional right now. When I tell you I spent the last quarter of a century feeling unheard, unseen, and unvalued, and she sold all of that up in one, maybe it was 20 minutes or four, she sold it all in one little documentary. I advise everybody to go to YouTube and look her up, Leah Gordon. I, I want to do this. Um because we can't, we can't stay too long, but I'm, no, 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 I want you to stay up really quickly. Um, guys, I'm going to continue talking to the dopest nerd, see if there's some stuff that we can do, maybe get her um, back on to share her story. But um, thank you guys for being here. Um, she and I are going to have just a little offline chat, if you don't mind, um, and hit the like on the way out. And if you're new to the channel, please subscribe. I think we just got a couple... Um, this well-spoken woman is my hero. I think she should get into politics. I mean, they're talking about you. <laughs> WIRF TV, thank you for the super chat. Um, Camille says, hi, Mims. I'm a new member. Can I be a mod? Um, we Mods take a while. Um, I have a few. Um, P. Diddy's trolls in the chat. That's fine. Um, C. Black, thank you so much for the super sticker. Kelsey, I'm sorry this is happening to you. How can we support you? We're gonna. She and I will talk about that really briefly. And boss lady, how does she feel about the case reopening? Um, I'm very, I'm very pleased. Okay. Um, so guys, 
Thank you so much for being here. I'll definitely be back tomorrow. And um, me and Miss the Dopest Nerd are just going to have a brief conversation. So you guys have a good night. Stay safe. Um, and tell your loved ones that you love them because you never know what tomorrow will bring. That's right.